Welcome once again to the DRH Show. Today, I'm joined by the founder of The Grace Project, Margaret Ward Martin. Thanks for joining me. You're very welcome. Very welcome. Well, it's great to have you here, Margaret. Well, thank I'd you for like... inviting me. Thank yeah, th you. thanks for accepting my invitation. Let's start off with your background and also your trajectory in life and how you ended mm -hmm. up doing what you're doing. Thank you. Yes. Um... I um, have had a, a varied life, uh, several careers, uh, several incarnations. Um, so I was a teacher for 25 years and um, trained as a therapist during that time. And now I'm um, my main body of work is um, as a therapist in private practice. And I founded the Grace Project uh, last year, which specifically looks at narcissistic abuse. So. I um, have uh, tried to provide a platform for people to access resources and learn more about uh, specifically narcissistic abuse. So let, let's talk about your clients, Margaret. So who mm -hmm. usually avail of your service and what therapies mm -hmm. do you offer? Well, um, I'm a person-centered therapist. That's my training. Mm -hmm. But I do have elements of psychodynamic and cognitive, depending on what the client presents. But um, interestingly, I, I, I work with addicts or people who've suffered from um, addiction, either process or substance or eating disorders. And um, I find the common denominator is trauma. So generally speaking the, the substance abuse and and um a, a program of sobriety is important to be able to access um the, the self in in any meaningful therapeutic work but i i am in my experience i'm not i haven't had any clients without deep trauma so whether it be abuse um i'm working with clients who've come to me because they have an addiction um, or substance issue uh, behind that, there will be some kind of trauma. S sometimes it's abuse. So um, that's how I, I come with clients presenting with an issue, generally speaking, addiction or um, significant impairment um, psychologically, but behind that is trauma. And talk, talking about trauma, I just remembered, um, uh, I saw this somewhere on Twitter that there's trauma-informed approach when it comes mm -hmm. to counseling. Do you yeah. also utilize that approach? That's really a really interesting question. Dennis. Yeah, I I can't assume anything because it's person-centered. So I, I let the client tell me their story and they invite me on their journey. And I'll be aware that, generally speaking, I'm seeing them at, in, in, a, in a crisis or in a in a behavioral pattern. So my experience tells me that there's probably some trauma. And um, so, yes, I would definitely um, engage trauma-informed practices once the client brings that to the sessions. But I can't project that onto the client and I can't um, lead the therapy. I can't drive it with my own agenda. Absolutely. Now, just to follow up on what you were talking about earlier, narcissistic abuse, yes. um, I understand you're very familiar about it, but some people might not have come across, yeah. you know, the, the concept of narcissistic abuse. So yes. What makes it a narcissistic abuse as opposed to any other kind of abuse? That's such a good question. I, I, I really appreciate this opportunity to explore mm -hmm. it because I think it's pernicious, it's subtle, and... Um, in relationship, for example, um, it's a slow burn. Uh, on the Grace Project, there's blogs and there's insight into what narcissistic abuse is, but it's a pattern of behavior where in an intimate relationship, um, uh, whatever that looks like, the, in an intimate relationship, it will start as a fairy tale. It's, um, uh, it's ideal, it's fantastical, it's fantastic. Uh, uh, there's, it seems perfect and it's intense. And then that might be followed by a period of devaluation where the person may be called out on how they look or, uh, or the survivor will be called on how they look or criticized. And it's low, low level. 
um, they may be asked to not attend events with their friends and isolated from their intimate um, friends or intimate circle. And then eventually they'll be discarded. But that's only after the, the self is decimated. So through gaslighting or through um, uh, various really quite unpleasant forms of uh, abuse, it could be uh, it could be financial abuse as well, so that they, they, they're controlled and they can't actually have a life outside of the home. So it's, um, it's, it's very closely aligned with the crime of coercive control. And as we know, that was only enshrined in law in 2015. So it's still in its infancy. And the hardest thing about narcissistic abuse is proving it because there's very little evidence. It can be he said, she said, or he, he said, he said, she said, she said. And it's, it, 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 there tends to be very little um, forensic evidence. So, um, and it's very subtle. So you, again, it's, so, so somebody could be doing something, something like that. So I was like, I'm really worried about you. I don't think you should go out. The, the streets are dangerous, uh, which is, is understandable. However, it can, it could also be that the person doesn't want their partner to, to, to ever leave the house. And so they, it, it, their life outside the house gets controlled um, and slowly eroded. Um, and uh, yes, financial abuse, where they just take over the money and say, well, I'll give you an allowance or, you know, let's have a joint account. So everything goes into a pot, but the abuser takes the lion's share. So there's lots of really quite subtle um, ways in which they can um, slowly erode the self. And sanity is the last to go. Sanity is it, when the person is confusing, uh, saying, well, I told you I was going out with friends and I told you I couldn't pick up my phone for two days or whatever. Um, and the survivor's just confused. And that's really, the, the the final step, the, the final um, and most, probably the most significant damage done because um, the self is destroyed. You know, I think I'm going mad is, is tends to be how it ends. And then the abuser is probably replaced the partner and uh, moved on. But it, it isn't just intimate partners. It can happen in the workplace and it can happen at a national and international level where communities or cultures are um, gaslighted. They're, they are told one thing when something else is going going on, something else is going on. Uh, um, I, I, <laughs> I was just going to say, Margaret, that the fact that it's subtle, as, as you've um, described it, um, I think that's make it so dangerous because we, we don't know yeah. what's going to happen or whether it's, it's taking place. But could you just um, share to us that the mental health implication of narcissistic abuse, and I think you already mentioned a few examples, some anxiety, but yeah. other than that, are there yeah. any other implications? That's a, that's a, 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 a fantastic question. It, it's really important to understand that it's a, it can be a slow burn. So life with a narcissist or in a narcissistic environment is very, very stressful. So the, treading on eggshells would be um a, a, a sentence i would hear from clients i you know i'm i'm i feel like i'm treading on eggshells and they can't relax and um they feel they they might be abused but they're not really because there's no blood so there could be uh, for example a shouting match that leaves the the person traumatized and shaky and th this long term chronic stress can lead to serious health implications anxiety being one of them, depression being another, maladaptive behavior is an option. So people drink more or use substances to cope or eat or don't eat. And those behaviors, those symptoms will then mask the underlying abuse. Um, so if there's, there could be benign neglect. So somebody may not go for their health screening. Um, they may have find a lump, for example, and they just don't bother getting the attention to it because they're getting more and more depressed. So um, one of the posts I talked about, it's called a perfect murder, which is the kind of 
uh, ways in which people have serious health, mental and physical health um, consequences, but they're never quite identified as being as a result of the abuse. So a doctor or physicians or mental health professions um, or health professions in general may not know, they may not see it because they're they, they are dealing with the symptom, which could be addiction. It could be high blood pressure. It could be um, it, it, worse asthma, even if it's stress related. It, it's there's lots of difference. It's it's smoke and mirrors. And and so I, I think what um, pe people like you, professionals like you, is that you're helping people realize that you're actually being um, a victim of this form of abuse. And mm -hmm. uh, I understand because I, I was doing my research um, about your the service that you offer. I understand that you also um, help people with betrayal trauma. So how yes. does these two differ? And, you know, are, are there any different signs? Yeah, so that betrayal trauma is part of the body of work because very often um, the, the abuser will have a secret life. And um, so if a betrayal is discovered, then not only is the person in this form of abuse because they've been lied to, but they, they, they've got to revisit their whole life because it's um, not been what they thought it was. So betrayal trauma has symptoms of PTSD um, uh, and, and very often mirrors the symptoms of PTSD in the sense that there's an initial shock, the discovery, and then the unpacking of the lie, the lies, the years of lies, the extent of the, the betrayal. Um, and that's in an intimate partnership, but it can also be on a systemic. So, for example, if, a, if somebody's revealed a, a, a distress or an abuse to another, uh, an authority figure, uh, and that authority figure betrays, um, it can be deeply, deeply traumatic. It, it's, um, it, it's, it destroys a sense of trust and safety. So coming back to the intimate partner, if you have a marriage, for example, or a, a long-term civil partnership or a long-term relationship, and you discover that there's been uh, something that you don't know, partner or partners, other people involved, then that leaves you with a sense of what's real and what's not. So everything is thrown into question. If, you know, who knew, who didn't know, um, that when we were on that holiday, you were actually in contact with somebody else. Uh, when money goes missing, it's, um, it can have significant, um, it's an indicator that something was going on, so that it can have so many consequences. So betrayal talk is a, is a body blow. It's, it feels like a body blow. It can have, in, in its initial stages, palpitations and uh, panic attacks and anxiety attacks and a sense of um, what, what's real and what's not. This life you've been living or the life that the betrayed has been living is not real. And if the partner wants to stay together and they work through the relationship, it's got to be remembered that one person in that relationship knew what was going on the other discovered and that's where it, I f feel very uh, strongly about the um, betrayed getting the level of support they need because it's, it's hard to work when uh, perhaps their partner's been found out, uh, found out that their partner's being uh, um, unfaithful. It shakes them to the core. So that's my interest in, in specifically betrayal trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just wondering what, what kind of people are likely to fall victim to narcissistic abuse? Is there a certain personality type or is there something about their childhood experience yes. that makes them vulnerable to this kind of abuse? Yes, um, I was actually reading through that. I posted something this morning um, about, I called it's complicated, but it's about the relationship between early childhood trauma uh, or complex post-traumatic stress disorder, well, early trauma, being a template. So, for example, if a child has had to 
please the, the caregiver or please the authority figure in their early life, then their tolerance for perhaps neglect is higher. So I would say that there is definitely um, a correlation. I, I don't know. I'm not, I don't have, um, yes, there is a correlation being uh, emerging between early childhood trauma and faulty relationships and being in abusive um, or less than uh, respectful relationships as, as in, in adulthood or even at work, putting up with less than respectful conditions or behaviors from employers. If there's a dependent position, if a child is dependent on a parent or dependent on a, on a caregiver, and that person treats them badly, what does the child do? They can't go, they can't leave. So they tolerate it. And that um, degree of tolerance and that template for relation relating is somewhat skewed. So you're saying that, you know, when you get used to that kind of relationship yeah. dynamics, eventually you think that that is the normal yeah. form of relationship. And I, it, I suppose that's be. where, yeah. And I suppose that's where you, you you come in. So, what would you say are the keys to recovery? I've, the, 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 platforms like this, I think. I, I think awareness is the first. We, and certainly with narcissistic abuse um, and coercive control, if we look at its criminal partner, um, understanding that what's happening is abusive is the first step. So that's where recovery um, can begin, um, we, which is an internal process and an understanding and an awareness. And from that, learn, learning as much as possible. There are there's so many really useful resources online. I try to put out what I can. There are links on there to other highly skilled, very informative um, practitioners where by the person even if they need to leave, stay in the situation is understanding that something is happening to them and by understanding they can start to engage some of the strategies so maybe that they can't leave the partner but they do something called gray rock or, or um, soul distancing which is the person is telling me i'm ugly i'm fat i'm stupid i'm worthless i don't believe them because this is a part of the abuse. So, and, and in that time, be able to put strategies into place to be able to perhaps leave the partnership or leave the um, uh, employment um, when, when they can. I've got to put a rider in that, that um, and you, you'll understand this, that if it is um, immediate, then 999 is the only option if there is any immediate danger, even if there's not, and this is what the issue is. I think abuse is not, you know, my clients say, where's the blood? You know, abuse, if you feel threatened in your in an environment, call the police, you can call the police and they will come and they are very much more aware of bloodless um, or not physical, not only physical violence as being an indicator of abuse and um, being, stolen from being frightened is abuse and the police are, are, are there to, to support. So um, being aware is the first thing, safely extracting them oneself from the um, environment and um, getting away. If, if, you've, if there's co-parenting, it's keeping contact to a minimum, perhaps using uh, co-parenting apps, but uh, getting away is is the most important uh, aspect of uh, for recovery so that there's no what's called uh, hoovering um, or baiting or um, somehow um, lulling you into a false sense of security or lulling the survivor into a false sense of security so yeah so that the, the there's uh, there are communities that that help support um, people who are leaving those kind of relationships
Uh, as you've mentioned, Margaret, there are lots of resources and community, mm -hmm. and also, you know, um, we have conversations about this. In fact, you know, the experiences of celebrities such as John Intep and Amber Heard really um, hi highlights the, the, the consequences of narcissistic abuse. But um, do you think there are barriers um, or do you think we should be doing more um, to address uh, narcissistic abuse? Uh... Uh, yes, in the sense that th this is as much as I feel we can do for now, because people are, take time to understand it's in a they're in a in a in an abusive relationship, because it doesn't present a narcissist. I I can't diagnose any narcissist. I don't think many people can diagnose narcissists. It is possible to diagnose a narcissist, but one of the things that true narcissists don't, tend not to do is present themselves for um, uh, diagnosis. So the important thing is for the person to under, uh, to keep safe. I, I think it's it's really, again, platforms like um, what yours, I hope the information I've put online, I give real examples. So gaslighting, for example, when we're being gaslighted or when somebody's denying your reality, it's gaslighting. And it could be a parent who's the narcissistic abuser. So people can't necessarily leave the situation, but learning about it is more it is important. And I do feel that there's an increased interest in exposing narcissism as a phenomenon. And I'd love that to continue. If there's more that can be done, that would be it. More exposure. Absolutely. And I think it, it also gives a sense of confidence to the victims because the more that they can see it, it, it generates conversation within, you know, as, as you've mentioned earlier, the, the community. So it's easy yeah. for them to seek help. Now, um, let's pivot the conversation to other aspects of what you do. I understand you also help people when it comes to burnout. So just to mm -hmm. kind of establish the, the, the background, could you give us some different types of burnout and how can people prevent burnout? Well, it's it's again, you know, it, it, these these have this has emerged. My understanding and my interest has emerged from the abuse. So, the the, the study in, in, into abuse and my research into to abuse that highly stressful environments can have consequences that feel like um, a mental illness or can manifest themselves in mental illness or physical illness. And one of these is burnout. So, it was my interest in um, specifically parental burnout, which is not um, unusual when somebody's in a, in a narcissistic or an abusive relationship when they just can't cope anymore. So burnout is in fact not an illness in and of itself. It's a phenomenon. And it's the, the um, umbrella term for um, the collective or the acute, sorry, the cumulative effects of exhaustion um uh no uh, let up in, in in as i said with childcare, no support having to um perhaps keep the roof over somebody's head the family's head being um left with um it, it, insurmountable domestic tasks and that can lead to burn and probably working so it can lead to burnout and burnout can manifest itself in cynicism uh, irritability, um, maladaptive behaviors like using um, alcohol or drugs to, to medicate and cope, or not cope, but to, med to, to, to deal with um, the pain, the suffering, depression, anxiety. Um, and generally speaking, uh, just a, a, a lack of joy, the inability to feel any joy and a physical a very real physical exhaustion so we workplace burnout is is often highlighted or identified and it's the same you can have the quiet quitter who as the said the quiet quitter you turn up to what people turn up to work but they'll do the minimum they don't really want to be there there is a, a, a degree of um lack of interest or as again i use the word becoming cynical at work not not enjoying the work, certainly not giving it um, 
the the, the level of production that they perhaps once did. Moral injury at work is another cause of burnout, which is being in a toxic environment where people are unpleasant to each other. They're racist, homophobic, sexist. The environment is just morally really quite difficult. And if there's um, a, a, an environment where they, you can't speak out, then you're crushed. But you can't leave because you've got a mortgage or you've got children. So that kind of moral, uh, as I call it, a moral burnout um, and a toxic environment can be really debilitating. So again, it can lead to depression, anxiety, using or acting out in some way and really um, detrimental to the individual and the, the work environment. Um, and being asked too much, having no control of your, being told what to do. I don't like to use any specific examples, but let's just think of maybe on a global level, the, the a boss coming in and saying, you're fired or you know, finding out that your email, uh, you're, 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 you're no longer in employment by um, social media. It's, it's not, um, it's not um, very respectful of the individual. So that can lead to burnout. And um, you know, relationship burnout is also really important uh, to, to look at, and that's different to abuse. But we get tired. We, you know, people are in relationships; they've got a lot of pressures, a lot of financial um, worries right now. All of this can lead to a, a lack of connection between individuals, and slowly they uh, drift apart, and that can be really damaging to a relationship. But that's different to abuse. And there's, there's a lot of strategies that um, can, I could say the little differences, the little, the small changes can make big differences. And I feel that you know, taking time to, to listen to your partner, taking time for date nights or outings or whatever you can, can manage. But um, yes, yeah, so, so my interest in burnout has, has uh, it's, it's a, it's come out of the, the deeper, darker work, which is that that's, um, I think generally speaking, there's people are exhausted at the moment. So we want to avoid burnout. And again, the, 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 the primary um, work we can do is prevent it. So that's my interest in, in burnout. I, I really like the the way that you link narcissistic abuse with with um, burnout because I'm until now I haven't really re realized that the link between the two and um, I, I, like we've said um, it's really important that we um, educate people so you know they become aware of um, um, burnout and also narcissistic abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand that you, um, you 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 mentioned that it's not really a form of disease, but how can we I suppose for lack of a better term, how, how can it be treated or how can we help um, people who suffered from burnout? How, how can we help them? Again, first of all, recognizing that something's a bit off. So I think that I, I've, I'm on my own journey. Um, so if I was speaking to my 20 year old self or, or my 30 year old self, or 40 year old, I would have said, um, it's okay to feel as you feel and share what's going on with you. So if um, um, a, a parent you know, wants to curl up in a ball, <laughs> um, something's not okay, you know, they're not coping. And it's okay to find parenting hard because it's the best job in the world, but it's also really, really demanding and physically, spiritually, emotionally, financially exhausting. And there can be um, unrealistic expectations in all these areas. Of, I think where there's burnout in relationships, in parenting and in work, that let's get it real. Let's make it acknowledge that life can be really, really tough. And there are times that we cope better than others. So being able to understand that if, if you're feeling off, it's okay to talk about finding parenting 
hard and um, needing to take time out. And uh, we love our children and our, they, our children know they're loved. However, there are times when it, we just need a break and it needs to be meaningful. So I think that that's certainly um, one way in which we can um, prevent a burnout, whatever, <laughs> whatever type is by talking, find a safe place to talk about it and acknowledge that something's not okay and seek support. Um, yeah, and be more honest about how we experience life rather than an airbrushed life, which I think maybe social media has a degree of input in that life's not easy. And I think particularly at the moment with the financial pressures, um, the cost of living crisis, the, the uncertainty around the future that people are really, really worried. So talking about it, I think, is the first step. It's seeking help is um, the second. In, and if it, it might take a village to be able to help you look after the family or look after yourself, but it's important to find people who are able to support you. Um, practice self-care is another way. I think learning how to say no is is transformative nothing less than transformative if we're able to say no i can't do the overtime or i can't help you pick up your child or i can't do a b or c it's it can it's transformative um and to, you know, doing lovely things being creative remember what you did as a child or when you're a teenager what you like to do start to do that and if you have children and it's not able to you're not able to perhaps get care for them, bring them along and do, do creative things together. I hope that's some insight. <laughs> yeah, I, I, absolutely. I think it all boils down to ha having some um, thinking, thinking um, patterns being changed or your, your behavior patterns being changed. Um, as, as you've mentioned, Margaret, that when we talk more about it, it really highlights what, what, what's wrong and we, we have to change it. We have to we have to change the way we think about it. Now, um, in relation to this, Margaret, I understand that you're running a series of healing workshops. Yes. Um, can you tell us what these entail and how can people find more about them? Right. So, yes, um, as a part of my pro program, uh, of, of I, I, I can work on a one-to-one, -one, but I also think having time out is really important so in january there's a healing from burnout uh, weekend in in hertfordshire and then in february healing from betrayal trauma and then in march end of march beginning of april healing from narcissistic abuse just a two-night stay but it's intensive care and it's and it, it the the aim is to give people a safe place to explore what we've already been talking about today, Dennis. These areas of our lives where perhaps it's time to take responsibility, to take ownership, take um, um, the, 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 the measures and, as you said quite rightly, the reflection um, to work out how to do it differently. So these are therapist-led. So I'll, I'll be on heading the team, but there'll be other therapists on site and it will be a two day or two night, um, nearly two day um, community, very small group, a very small group with, with breakout groups within the group where we'll look at what burnout is in the first one, what burnout is, how it's manifested itself in our lives, what we can do about it, uh, and then personalize um, goals. And um, then that will be followed up by one-to-one -one work or a one-to-one -one call and then a group later on in the year to see what's going on. But essentially it's a safe um, a safe space that's time for reflection, renewal, um, and I think rediscovery of what what we're doing with our lives because we only get one shot. <laughs> so so I, that's that's the idea of the weekends to provide this place and space absolutely and it's really important but just to clarify for anyone who's watching this we're recording this conversation last week of november 
um, but I will upload this. You you might be watching this um, beginning of January. So yeah. the, the January that um, Margaret just mentioned is January 2023. Just to just to clarify. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but just to car carry on with our conversation, uh, Margaret. So it's essentially these healing workshops. I suppose the components of healing journey where you help yeah. your your clients, but. What can individuals expect from the healing journey? I appreciate that it's not really the same for everyone else, but what, yeah. what can they expect? What, would there be any bumps that they can um, expect along the way? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so you're right, we, we all heal differently and there's, it's, it's not agenda driven. So the understanding is that we take ownership, that we, as I said, we have this one opportunity that we're in the we're all on the planet at this time and this this place um and it's deciding and choosing what to do with your life and i think when you have a, a healing experience or a heal, you're working either on a one-to-one -one with a therapist or in a group or going on a retreat like um the healing from series it's about um working out where you are and where you want to be and bridging the gap, finding out what's realistic uh, and bridging that gap, but also developing self-compassion because I find a lot of people blame themselves and judge themselves for situations they've been in or they, they, these, the, um, where they're, they're at in life when in fact it's a part of the, the, it is part of the journey. We wouldn't be who we are if we hadn't experienced everything that preceded it. So, it's important to um, be, um, I think, self-respectful, practice um, self-compassion. And then, um, I, I'm a great believer in revelation. And, and by that, I mean that things happen in our lives and opportunity present themselves. And it's finding the courage to, to take those opportunities and believe in ourselves sufficiently. And if you've been worn down in a relationship or you've been worn down by a, a dismissive employer, then it's working out your own value and, and, and honoring yourself and respecting yourself and then progressing from that. But it's very gentle. I really, as I said, no punishment, just understanding that you're, that people make their best choices at the time based on the information they have and then when you have more information you might make different choices absolutely now margaret this conversation really um, requires more time we, we we have to unpack a lot of things when it comes to narcissistic abuse and and betrayal yeah. trauma and also um recovery but we're already approaching towards the end of this interview and i'd just like to like um wrap this up with some um, light-hearted quick-fire questions and also as an opportunity to learn more about you as a cool. person. Let's so, go for uh, it. Yeah, what I'd like to hear from you is um, what were you afraid of as a child? Um, that's a really good question. What was I afraid of as a child? Um, you said quick-fire, let me think. Um, being on my own. Yeah. And what is your favorite word in another language? um namaste <laughs> and, and it's it's an indian word Re it's remind great. me again what does it mean peace 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 and mm -hmm. if you weren't a coach what would you have pursued in your life uh well i i said i've had many different career many different careers so i i just pursue what i pursue i don't think there's anything i haven't wanted to do at some stage that i haven't done but the best is being a mum, I have to say. I do enjoy being a mum. <laughs> oh, yeah, we, we can all agree that's one of the best careers. And um, Margaret, finally, the floor is all yours. If people wanted to reach out to you, what platforms yes. can they get in touch with you at? And do you have any upcoming projects aside from the healing workshops? Yes. Thank you, Dennis. First of all, thank you to you. And again, for, for all the good work you're doing. Um, yes, the Grace Project, it's graceproject.co.uk. Um, is uh, my website and, and there's information about the retreats and you can contact me through the, through the website or on LinkedIn. Uh, I, ongoing posts that inform people about 
narcissistic abuse and um, just uh, the dark side of human nature. So that's my ongoing work and, and I will be posting regularly and I do that on the website and through LinkedIn and on various social media. So you can co contact me through the Grace Project at the first instant and if you're interested in, in coming along and joining me or counseling directory for one-to-one -one work. And as I said, LinkedIn would be a general platform. Anybody more than welcome to get in touch. Thank you, Margaret. And all of those links for anyone who's watching, um, you'll find them on the description note. Well, uh, Margaret Ward Martin, coaching psychologist and the founder of The Grace Project. It's great to have you here on the VRH show. And I look forward to hearing more about your work. Thank you, Dennis, very much. Thank you.